They say that success is built on strong foundations. So when 20 years ago, when Stuart Watkiss took the reins of Mansfield Town's first team, a side which was full of his youth team starlets, fans dared to dream of achieving promotion. There were twists and turns along the way and it went all the way to the wire. But in the end, Watkiss and his side made dreams come true. Ball into the area for Kelly, keeps possession, drives it across the edge of the six yard area, cleared as far as Hassel, back into the box it goes, and we're in front, Mansfield have it, and it's Andy White, it's absolutely nuts at field mill. Corner then, he's going to take this corner, holds both arms aloft, the uh, referee waiting to give the signal, Williamson's on the goal line, Greenacre's near the near post, into the area it goes, Tankard heads it goalwards, it's in, it's Andy White, Andy White's made it 2-0. And now we have a little bit of a comfort zone. The referee looks again at his watch. It's just about over. Three seconds remaining. The referee's blown and Mansfield are promoted to Division 2. Scenes of jubilation at Field Mill. This is the Mansfield Matters podcast and 20 years on, we're recalling the stories from that historic campaign with those at the heart of it all. This is Stag Stories, the glory of the Amber Generation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming back to the stage Andy White, Ken Richardson, and Stuart Watkins. Thank you very much. Now, gents, obviously, we're having a little watch uh, along that. Richard, I'll start with, uh, with yourself. What memories sort of came flooding back when you were watching? Players like Pilks, Chrissy Greenacre, and uh, Bas Stater, there, the former physio as well. What memories were coming back when they were recalling those stories? I think Pilks hit the nail uh, on the head there, where he said, Everyone's a friend. All friends then, all friends now. Uh, everyone was prepared to run through a brick wall for each other. Uh, all good players, all very good players. And um, we all had an end of season goal, and the end of season goal was to get promotion. Whether we go first, second, third, playoffs or whatever, it was just literally, let's get promoted and let's play higher up. Simple as. Skip, what about yourself watching those back and hearing um, all the different voices there recording those stories and memories? Yeah, I, as I said before, <laughs> special, special day, but for, for me, it, it kind of started on the, on the Thursday and Plymouth had already been promoted and we had to, I think we had to win and obviously rely on uh, Cheltenham who played down at Plymouth on the last game of the season and Paul Stewart rang me up on the Thursday and he went, Stuart, I promise you we will beat Cheltenham. He said, I promise you we'll beat them. He went, we fucking hate country. <laughs> I absolutely promise you, if you win, you will get promoted. Which was fantastic for me to hear, so obviously relayed that to the to the lads. And then the Friday, we, we trained on the pitch, and we practiced set pieces, unopposed, and honestly, they were fucking rubbish. You were like, they fucking, on the Friday, they, they honestly, unopposed corners for, it was, so in the end, we kind of made a joke of it, yeah, let's go, it'll be okay tomorrow. Game comes, and like, I've always been glass half empty kind of guy. That is, worst case scenario, worst case scenario. I woke up on a Saturday morning, and I, I swear to God, I've never had a feeling like it before or since, I knew we were getting promoted. I just knew it. Don't know how, don't know. Drove in, dead relaxed, got here, dead relaxed. Uh, game starts, we get a corner early doors, me and him look at each other, they've only set up the most complicated what the, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> this could be good. And then it works like a dream, in it goes, one nil up, and then literally it was straight after that, they? they shout down from the press behind the dugout, Plymouth are winning one nil, fantastic. You score a second. Yeah. Big, <laughs> big man scores the second. Uh, again. Not long after, press shout down, Plymouth are winning 2 0. Fantastic. No, we were total control of the game, to be fair. And I remember the second half, the, the place was really quiet. 
really, second half, until about five minutes to go, and it just literally, all of a sudden, it started to, to take off. Chris said, you know, all the fans were literally right, right on the edge of the pitch. And then obviously when the, the final, well they shared down, Plymouth have won 2-0, and we had about 90 seconds, two minutes, where we could literally just enjoy the moment. Uh, whistle then, just like, fantastic, fantastic time. You mentioned Chrissy there on the episode which we recorded uh, with him. He tells a nice little story. Uh, gives a nice lot of thanks to you. That final game of the season, you take him off with about five, ten minutes to go, and he always felt in his heart of hearts that that was almost your way of letting him say goodbye. Yeah, it was. It was just felt right at the time. You know, as I say, we were always going to win the game. It wasn't a close one nil, and we were under pressure or anything like that. Felt like the right thing to do. He he done so well for for Stags during his time at the football club. We knew he was leaving at the end of the season. Uh, so yeah, it felt like the right thing to do, and, and obviously he deserved the reception he got. We actually said that he was stood next to us, wasn't he? He was stood next to us, and the skips went, "Get over the far side," and send him right over the far side beside all supporters. So, so when the referee blows the whistle, makes the substitution, Chris has got an extra like 50, 60 yards to get the close, which he deserved. And but I, I always used to send players over to the far side for substitutions if we were winning. I would always say, fuck off over there. And then I'd put the up, come on. So it just a few more seconds or so. Yes. But Chris he deserved it, it was the right thing to do. Yeah, and uh, Richard, in terms of him as a player as well. It was a tough guy, this man was, was it 3 and 4, was it, Andy, in the last uh, end of the season? Yeah, no, I don't mention it much on the podcast, do we? Um, Chrissy was instrumental in that as well, but he could have also left in uh, January. Uh, how much of a relief was it when, you know, your first day on the job as assistant to Skip and you know that Chrissy's staying? How much of a relief is that to you as somebody that's coming from almost outside the dressing room into the dressing room to try and carry this squad forward? Well, we think. We, we knew Chris Fields, uh, he was allowed to speak to all the clubs, uh, so we knew he was going to go end of season at the, at the, late, at the latest. Um, I think, it, I think it did, if I remember right, but he got a lot of his goals early on didn't he, in the season. So I think he got something like 20 goals before Christmas. Yeah, 20 before Christmas. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, it, it, we had to have him. We had to, we had to, we had to stay, from for our point of view. Um, we, 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 needed a goal, we needed a goal scorer, but we did know we, had, we, we also knew we had backup. Uh, which is why Stu Brook brought in uh, Ned, brought Ned Kelly in. Obviously, Andy was there, and to be fair, I just watched the goal. I watched the goal back, and if you'd been a yard further back, you'd have missed that second goal. Well, if I had to shout to him, I'd have to score it. Because <laughs> <laughs> the angle behind the goal was not doing you any justice at all, was it? <laughs> That's what I was saying, though. If I had to shout to him, he'd have got it. No, but, but bring, bring, bringing Ned in was a bit of a masterstroke, as well as Scotty Sellers. Because, because them two, what, what, what they did was, was like, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't bottle it. Because Liam and, Liam and Leroy all thought they knew everything. But Scott, Scotty and, 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 and uh, Ned used to turn around and say, oh, have you ever played in front of 50,000 Anfield and scored? And Liam would just go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he couldn't answer that. And, and it was a way of keeping them in training. And they, they were absolutely fantastic for the young young the squad. I know you had a question about uh, them, them sort of players, didn't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, ju I'm just curious as to, you know, how that conversation went with Ned Kelly and, uh, and Scott Sellers as legends, you know. Was it a hard sell to get them to come to the club in terms of that conversation? No. Uh, actually, Scotty Sellers' agent approached me about Scott coming, and as soon as he said it, I just said, yes, thank you. Uh, and Ned, I've known Ned since we were 14, 15, from the West Midlands and, and, and playing against each other. So, again, it wasn't a difficult decision. Again, as soon as I mentioned it to Ned, he wanted to come. And as, as Richard says, you know, those two, Les, Alan Tanker, fantastic. Because I could say my bit at half time and literally sometimes just speak for two or three minutes and then step away and you would see these pros going around to the younger people, just taking them to one side and and and, and talking them through it. So again, fantastic people, passed on the experience and just dovetailed really nicely with the with the youngsters. Yeah, and 
And of course, talking of experienced players, one man who we've had on, we saw a little bit there, was uh, Les Robinson, and he had some great stories from Chris and Greenacre. Have either of you two got a, a Les Robinson insight, a little story that you want to tell about Les being a, a captain and a character off the pitch? I, have, I haven't got a, a story as such about Les. What, what, what I would say about Les, um, if I remember it rightly, I don't think I remembered it correctly, Richard's put me right, but in my head, um, Les left at the end of that season, and I got it in my mind that I wanted to bring two big centre-halves in real, commanding centre-halves, and I think Les was under a little bit of pressure for his missus to get back down to back down south. Um, and I, I let Les go too early because then what happened, the, uh, the ITV digital money fell through and basically there wasn't enough money in the kitty to bring the centre arse in that, that I wanted. And, and, and the way that it worked out the following season with, with the injuries that we had and everything, Les would have been in, invaluable to us. So maybe I have to roll my hand up and say, I made a mistake there. Uh, it was done for the, for the best reasons, uh, or the, the right reasons, but we, we missed Les massively that the, the season after. One thing he did say on his episode uh, was that he actually felt it, it was the right time to go because he felt that had he stayed and gone on and things not gone as well as they did, which it turned out that, that way, that he would have been the next one to get an arm felt by the chairman. He said that he didn't want that pressure. He didn't want to go into that dressing room feeling like you knew in your head that it might have been a matter of time before he was brought into your shoes. We, we talk about the next season, the, the, we've just spoke about what the day, the promotion day was. I went into the chairman's office, it was either the Tuesday or the Wednesday after promotion, and we spoke about budgets for the next season. And I come out of the office and Richard and Paul and Ivan and, and, and the, the staff were, were all in the office. And I, I said, I come out of the office and I said to them, I'll be sat by Christmas. And they looked at me and I said, just found out what the budget is. I said, I'll, I'll be gone by Christmas. We can't, can't compete on that. And that was from going up there on the Saturday, three, four days later, you know, I, I've said before, I felt like the, the, the season after, to a certain degree, that at times, I felt like an England batsman of, of the 80s facing the West Indian pace attack. And, you know, not only did I not have pads or an helmet, I didn't have a fucking bat at the time. So <laughs> that's, that's how it felt. You know, we started the season with 10, I think, missing. It was about 10 missing we started the season with. And then it got up to 13 or 14. And we've spoken about pre season, all pre season, we've done 4 4 2. 4 4 2, 4 4 2. And then we played Plymouth on the first day of the season. I come in on the Friday morning and I said, I said to Richard, I'm playing this team on tomorrow against Plymouth. And it, it was a weird formation, wasn't it? I'll show you what it, I'll tell you exactly what it was. It was, it was three, three, three defenders, three midfield, three attackers, and Cords could play wherever he wanted. So, I said to him, have you got an absolute bone here or what? He, he looked at me and he went, are you taking the piss? I went, no, no, no. I said, look, they're more or less in, in, in the kind of the, the best positions. So we're not playing anyone like a fish out there. They're nearly in the right positions. So I remember going down to the, to the lads on the Friday and I said, Richard, I think, brought the team out. I said, we're playing that tomorrow. And I fucking looked at me like I was an idiot. And I went, we played the youth team this morning. We played the youth team this morning. We'll be all right. We'll play them. We played uh, Paul Holland's youth team. Fucking hell, they're bad at us. We're <laughs> learning this. So, he comes after training and he can't play. I'm not playing that then, no, are you? And I'm like, no, I'm playing it. Just, just going to play it. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. So, anyway, game comes. 
And uh, 90 minutes, I think, before what long? Have you scored again? You scored a couple again, yeah? Four, yeah, so we're 4 1 up, 90 minutes, and, and to be fair, we're fantastic, fantastic. And then they scored two late goals in injury time to make it 4 3, which was kind of a sign of things to come in the season, unfortunately. Uh, but the lads were, were fantastic, and Kevin Sutton wasn't there that day, he, he, was, he was ill, because obviously I wanted to thank him for the last day of the last season. And Kevin Sutton comes up in. Fucking formation, did you play that? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> that was it. so. But that day just, if you like, showed what that season was going to be where the football we played was still fantastic, but we couldn't not concede goals, especially set pieces. I think we went to Wigan and we lost 3 2, second game. Can we tell a story about Wigan? <laughs> Is this yes one? is the answer. Don't listen to what he says. Yes is the answer. Is this the one where you get sent off? <laughs> well, Scotty Sellers gets sent off. Scotty Sellers gets sent off first after about 20 minutes. Yeah. And Stu, Stu being. So I, I politely said to the fourth official that I didn't quite agree with that decision, <laughs> which he took offence to and sent me to the to the stand. So as I'm as I'm leaving, I've said to him. He says to me. He says to Dutch. He says. Leave your phone on because I'll be, I'll be sending messages down to oh, if things happen. So I said, yeah, no problem. I said, Dutch is on his phone. And <laughs> three or four times I've looked back and he's fuming in the back of the stand because he can't get the message down because Dutch is on the phone talking to his missus. <laughs> <laughs> Dutch is on the phone talking to his missus half time good and he's absolutely fuming. Even though we've played well, he's absolutely fuming. Oh, I haven't been, Dutch is like, I haven't been on the phone. <laughs> Dutch's story, or Dutch's version, is him saying, ignore it, don't answer it. <laughs> uh, uh, but, that, again, I think we lose 3 2 a late DeVos Edda. And I mean, Paul Joe comes in afterwards and he went, You look, don't half pass it, don't you? On the Saturday, we go to the Cup. I think we're 3 2 up until the last minute, and we can see it again, long throw, draw three each. Um, that was the only one where I went mad and you were calm. I was quite calm because I'm really pleased with the way that we're playing and um, what he's done he's out there. He's come, we've come in, we've, we've conceded from a long throw in the last minute against Wickham. So one point becomes, so three points becomes one point. And I'm like, it, he comes in, he, he has his say first, he's really calm. And I go, I'm not sure because I'm not fucking happy about this, like. Right? We've just conceded two points. We can't just defend. A long throw, just go and hit the ball. Literally, just go and hit the bloody ball. I didn't say bloody, by the way. <laughs> just go and hit the ball. And it was, it was as simple as that. And as you said, that was that cost us so much. Still won football there. Still won to watch. There we go. It, it, was, it was, but it was so frustrating because we, we, we come three games, first three games of the season. We, we, got, we got three points in the first game. We got nothing second game, even though we played ever so well. And we got one point from the third game. So we've got four points from three games when we could have easily had nine. Uh, nine to be expecting more than we, we got, we should get, but we were so close. And we could have won it. I think we actually had a, a five or six games where we lost then. And I remember we went down to Luton then and we got them out and then we beat them 3 0 away. And I'll never forget it to this day. The first person to call me up that day was Paul Joe, who just kind of seen that we'd had a tough time, we just got to out in. I think he liked the way we played, and I'll never forget it. The first person to call me on the coach was Paul Joe to say, Fuck you know, well done. I'm really pleased for you. And it's just little things like that you uh, always remember, you know. Can, can you remember Luton the year before? I was just going to come on to that because it's got a bit of a question on that, but you've got a bit of a point on Luton. It was when we, uh, when we spoke to Chris earlier, and it just kind of rung in my head. It was like a light bulb moment for me, and I remember it quite clearly now in terms of, uh, I think, did you drop Chrissy for that game away at Luton? I'm just trying to gain the thinking behind, the reasoning behind that. Was it to get a reaction? Was it? It was a bit of both. We, we knew he, uh, we knew he was leaving, and I, I didn't think Chrissy had been quite at it for three or four games. Um, 
I think as well to, to, to Rich Hour about it. And I think that was Clarkie's debut as well, didn't we? We, we chucked Clarkie in as well. But uh, yeah, it was a tough decision, but I just felt that he wasn't just quite at it. Uh, and then, how many did we lose? Five, three, I think. Again, you know, just, that was us. I mean, the, the, the next season, the season obviously I, I went in the December, but week in, week out, managers would come and shake my hand after the game and say, you're the best team we played, but they just beat us 4-3 or 5-4 or 3-2. And right at the end of my tenure, I think we played Bristol City out here. Oh. And we fought to up. I mean, Bristol, top of the league, Danny Wilson manager. Don't think they'd lost for 18 games. And for, for, seriously, for 90 minutes, the lads could, could not have played any better. They could not have played any better than what they played. And I think Leroy got sent off, didn't he? And so we played some, with, with 10 men as well. We fought to up, uh, whatever. We have to make a couple of substitutions, lads who haven't played have to come on for one reason or another. Long story short, we lose the game 5-4. And I remember, again, Danny Wilson came up to me and he went, Stuart, I can't even look you in the eye. He said, I can't look you in the eyes. Um, and I think, was it the week after, I think, we went to Port Vale. Uh, we're losing. And the fans are giving the chairman a load of stick. And I said, I said to Richard on the side of the pitch, we're fucked on Monday. And he looked and he went, no, they're hammering the chairman. And I went, exactly, he's got to do something now. And I actually came in on the Monday uh, and started clearing my desk. I knew, I knew. And he came in uh, and he, Exactly. Well, Keith Curl sitting next to him for three or four games uh, in the stand was, was a bit of a clue. Uh, so, we got the, the sack on the Monday. And uh, I, I remember, I'll, I'll tell this story. I spoke to John Barwell, who was in charge of the League Managers Association. And uh, I rung him up and John Barwell said, you've got to get a letter of dismissal. Right, he said, by law, he's got to give you a letter of dismissal. Okay, so I went to the chairman, said, uh, can I have a letter of dismissal, please? And he went, uh, oh, no, he said, I've not sacked you. I said, yes, you have. He went, no, 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 no. It's mutual consent. And I went, hang on a minute. You've just sat there, you've told Keith Curls coming, you've told Keith Curls coming in this afternoon, I said, what we're trying to do now is trying to mutually agree a settlement on the, on the contract. So, no, 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 I said, hang on, I said, can I have a letter of dismissal? And he went, no. I said, okay, I've asked you, you refused. I'll tell the other man. I tell the other man, and they said, he won't give you one, no. Have you resigned? No. Is it mutual? No. He went, you've got to go back to work tomorrow. So I ring Richard up and I went, we've got to go in tomorrow. <laughs> so, honestly, so me and Ian turn up really early, deliberately, deliberately and we go and sit in our office, or our ex office, and the chairman comes in at whatever time, he looks at us and he, fuck you doing here? And I went, you've not sat me, I've not resigned, I'm working like that. And he went, I think you better go to the swallow, he said, or to the me to the swallow. Uh, so I ring LMA up and I said, Chairman sent me to the swallow, shall I go or shall I carry on working? And he went, no, if he's sent me to the swallow. Uh, and, and, and that was it. But as we were leaving the ground, I actually crossed, crossed Keith Curl on the stairs. And I remember saying to him, I went, look, it's me today, Keith, I'm telling you, it could be six months, one year, two years, it'll fucking shit on you as well. I promise you. 
and then fast forward how, many, how long I don't know, but it's Carlton, Carlton, Carlton Palmer sitting next to the chairman and it's Keith Curley who is he's through the door. So. One of the things about that as well, I mean, we, we, we used to speak regular about this and, and we kind of knew it was going to happen because at the time the chairman had um, been banned from dr drink driving. And what he did, I lived in Sheffield along near where he lived. And what he did, he gave me his, remember his big Range Rover he used to have, he gave me his Range Rover to drive around, but I was basically driving him round. And I was dropping him off at pubs. And as I'm dropping off at pubs, Carlton Palmer walks in that pub, dropping off another pub, Keith Curl walks in that pub, Chris Warner walks in that pub. I'm telling him, Stu, me and Stu look at each other going, yeah, yeah, it's going to happen. And he used, to, he used to come in, he used to drop names about, and we, we knew, we knew. So basically, Going back to what Stu said, where it's unfinished business, that, that, that's, that's where it really does yeah. niggle. I'm hoping that by coming back tonight, a little bit of that has gone, because I think everybody will agree in this room that regardless of that exit, everyone will be on your side for that, but I think everybody will appreciate the sheer work you did over a number of years, which you, of course, accumulated in that promotion. So ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Neil Richardson. <laughs> Looking back tonight, you, you both come back here tonight. What are your overarching uh, thoughts? Obviously, you know it's a little bit of unfinished business uh, for, for you both, but it must fill you with the immense pride to see so many people come out and, and all the people they've been talking to still remember those days with the utmost of fondness. It's for me. It, it's it's 20 years. It's 20 years, and people still remember it. Um, it's. It, I, I was looking to play for 15, 16 years, but that, that day in Carlisle at home was the best day in my professional career. Because the amount of Stax fans that were there, the amount of noise they made, they sang the song Yellow, it's the only song I know the whole words for. <laughs> it, 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 will, it will never, I will never forget it, personally. Fantastic, and skip finally yourself. Just just special, special times, as I say. Um, I don't know exactly how long I was here, seven, seven years player, new coach, assistant, uh, manager. Just special times. Um, the, the, the club, obviously, uh, will always be very special. Uh, we, we're talking about unfinished business. I don't mean that, that I'm coming back. You know, my time has, has, has come and gone now, but just Fantastic, fantastic memories. Uh, hopefully, they can uh, they can repeat it this season. Uh, still, everything to play for. But you know, just just stick with the lads if it doesn't go the way you want it to go, because they are the toughest of tough games now in the running. And, fi and finally, from you, Andy, what's it been like seeing these two again after all this time? <sighs> well, I think. Any excuse to reflect, to remember, to, to, to reminisce is, is superb. Obviously, um, it's been a long time, Skip, Richard, in terms of, you know, when we've spoke, when we, we, we've communicated, so it's been really nice to, to see you again, to, to hear about what you've been doing, and obviously to reflect and remember with, you know, some great supporters. And I think Skip said before in terms of, how it means to him, what, what this club means to me. It gave me my chance in professional football, which I'll be forever grateful for. And I think, you know, overarching in terms of the, the welcome I had from the supporters was, was second to none. And, it, and it's always going to be a special place in my heart. I think I spoke to a few in the break in terms of, I've got a little lad now who's five, he's just starting to sit still for more than 20 minutes. So I'm going to be bringing him down to Field Mill and he'll be a, a stag going forward. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation for the previous job. Emmy White, Neil Richardson, and Storm of Kiss. I have in my hands a sheet with nine questions on. All general knowledge, it will start, it will spell the word Mansfield. So the first question will be which M, then which A, and so on and so on and so on until we spell Mansfield. 
Uh, what do I explain there? Okay, so you are going to be the marker of the quiz, so you're going to go and stand just at the table there with Alan. Uh, and Alan, you're going to take this timing device as well. It's the person who gets the most correct answers in the quickest time. So here you go, Alan. So you're both going to go and stand over there, and you will, uh, don't trip over the cable. So you, Alan, you're going to keep time for us, okay? Clive. No, 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 no. It's start the stopwatch when I say go, and then stop it when I say stop. Simple instructions, you can't get the staff. Uh, and then Clive, you're going to keep the score, okay? And then you're going to do the same for all three, and then at the end of the three, we'll see who's the winner. A little bit of Jeffrey, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, by a show of hands, who's thinking that Andy White is going to be the winner? <laughs> Who thinks it's going to be Neil Richardson? And by wow. to the rest of the room, who thinks it's going to be Skip? Okay, it's because he's got glasses on. Okay, looks more intelligent. So, Richard, you're going to need the mic, my friend. Okay, so keep the mic right, nice and close to the lips for me, please. Okay, you're going first, then it's Skip, then it's Andy, okay? Alright, so, are you ready to play? Okay, ready with the stopwatch? Ready with the marker? Okay. In three, two, one, start the clock. Which M is a yellow sauce often found on a hot dog? Mayonnaise. Which A is also known as the pub landlord? Quiet in the room, please. Which A is also known as the pub landlord? Al Almory. Which N is a London tube line which serves the station Goose Street and Leicester Square? Northern. Which S is a crime-fighting dog whose best friend's catchphrase is Lawrence? Scooby. Which F can be both good and bad if it's the 13th bed in the book? Right. Which I, according to the adverts, is the shops that mums go to? Iceland. Which E is the highest mountain in the world? Mountain in the world? Everest. Which L wanted you to shout was there in the 1960s? Lulu. And finally, which D is loved by Homer Simpson? Donald. Stop clock! Make sure you go and write the time down for me. I don't want to see it until the end. Write down the time and the score. Doesn't matter if there's any passes or anything, it's all, all about the score. Okay, so, Skip, you're up next. How do you think he did first and foremost? How do you think he did? Okay. It's like I say, my score was just like all of the road in Wolverhampton, so I don't expect too, too much of that. We'll see when we get the lead. Can my two of the assistants at the back start some of the raffle tickets out for us, please, so I can draw them straight away? They've already been done. Excellent. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> Just looking for the exit, I think it's going to be terrible. They're going to have to leg it out of the building. Okay, right, skip your next. Ready for set B, your questions are ready. Ready with the stopwatch? Ready with the weather in the pen, there we go. In three, silence in the room all the way through, please so the guys can hear the questions. And please no helping them out, that was just under, that's just one call for. Uh, okay, here we go. In three, two, one, stop the clock. Which M is a musical based on the songs of Abba? Mamma Mia. Yeah. What have I just said? Hey, time, time. <laughs> Which A is the biggest constant in the world? Which A is the biggest, which A is the biggest constant in the world? Africa! <laughs> which N is best known for driving a little red and yellow car? Okay. Okay. <laughs> which S is the tagline Taste the Rainbow? Whiskey. 
So what about the set? You've got the, you've got the ones to choose, so here we go. That's why I couldn't get my substitution dry under pressure. <laughs> here we go then. Ready with the stopwatch? Ready with the uh, marker? Okay. Why is he ready? My friend has to put a slip for us. Okay. In three, two, one, stop the clock. Which M in 1984 was like a virgin? Which A is a tennis star whose mum Judy was a contestant on Strictly Come Dancing? Andy Murray. Which M created by C.S. Lewis is access to a wardrobe? No, I mean. Which S is a Canadian singer songwriter who had a hit with Man I Feel Like a Woman? Do you know what I mean? Which F born in Toy Story 4 is made from trash? Which I is a crime fiction writer and creator of TV crime drama Rebus? Not me. Which E is the fictional capital city of the land of Oz? Emerald. Emerald. <laughs> <laughs> which L is an annual music festival which takes place at Annan Park, Suffolk? L. Which L is an annual music festival which takes place at Annan Park in Suffolk? Simon then joined us halfway along. 
Clyde did and Alan did uh, as well and I just want to express my thanks to them. So can I have a please have a round of applause for our fantastic podcast crew.